it will be forever remembered as a day of infamy. Without warning, Japan's bombers rained down terror on a Sunday morning in Hawaii. Lasting just two hours, their attack on Pearl Harbor would bring the United States into World War II, transforming America's destiny as a world power. Based on eyewitness accounts, this is a dramatized reconstruction of events as they happened on a day that shook the world. It is December the 7th, 1941. In North Africa, Montgomery's desert rats are locked in a deadly struggle with Field Marshal Rommel's Africa Corps. In Russia, Soviet troops are desperately fighting the Nazis outside the gates of Moscow. And in New York, Walt Disney's Dumbo has just had its premiere. Though it is early Sunday morning, naval intelligence officers have been working throughout the night. Sir? Sir? This just came across. I really think you should take a look at it. Are you sure this can't wait, Lieutenant? We've got to get back to the office. Naval intelligence is at the center of the most sensitive and top secret operation in the whole United States. Just 20 people are allowed access to the secrets contained in the folder. Lieutenant Commander Alvin Kramer, a Japanese specialist, is one of them. Brotherhood, we need to get this out straight away. Within the folder is an intercepted copy of the latest message to be sent between Tokyo and the Japanese embassy in Washington. Thanks to Operation Codename Magic, for the last year, the United States has been secretly decoding Japan's diplomatic signals. It's given them an unprecedented insight into the Japanese government's private thinking. But Commander Kramer has never seen a message like this one. Japan is a nation on a mission, a mission to build an empire. Over the last decade, this small island nation has grown from a rural economy into an industrial powerhouse. But Japan lacks that one vital prerequisite that could truly transform her into the regional superpower she is desperate to become. Natural resources. Japan is starved of oil, coal, and rubber, and in the face of an American trade embargo, is ready to seize them by force if necessary. She has already invaded China and Indochina. Now the rest of East Asia is in her sights. Yes. No, I want you to send it right away. That's right. Let me know if there's a response. Thank you. In the American capital, the administration of President Franklin Roosevelt is still working to defuse the crisis in the Pacific. The man in charge of keeping the peace with Japan American Secretary of State Cordell Hull is already at his desk. President Roosevelt finds himself torn. On the one hand, he would like to intervene in Europe in aid of Britain, now standing alone against the might of Nazi Germany. But joining the war is deeply unpopular. Public opinion in the United States is hostile to foreign intervention, preferring that America retain her historic isolationist stance. 
Now, tensions in the Pacific are threatening to drag her into another conflict she has no enthusiasm for. For the last 10 months, Cordell Hull has been negotiating with Tokyo, anxious to defuse that crisis and halt Japanese expansionism in Asia. But it is make or break time for the peace talks. The United States have issued Japan with an ultimatum, calling for her to withdraw from China and Indochina. Just yesterday, President Roosevelt made a personal appeal for peace to the Japanese emperor, and Secretary Hull knows Tokyo's response could come at any time. He will not have to wait much longer for his answer. Yes. The intercepted message on Commander Kramer's desk is Japan's much-awaited response to the American ultimatum. Such is the speed of their decoding operation that the United States government will read it hours before the Japanese ambassador. Kramer immediately realizes that far from quelling the crisis, Tokyo's message can only escalate it. In contrast to the polite diplomatic language of the last few months, it rejects Washington's ultimatum in the bluntest of terms. The Japanese government regrets to have to notify hereby the American government that in view of their attitude, it cannot but consider that it is impossible to reach an agreement through further negotiations. To Kramer, there was now a real puzzle. Was this instruction to break off diplomatic negotiations just a further act of diplomatic brinkmanship on the part of the Japanese? Or could it presage something more sinister? An attack on the British and Dutch in East Asia, or even on the United States itself? The Hawaiian island of Oahu and her massive naval base of Pearl Harbor. Almost two and a half thousand miles west of the California coast, for America, this will be the front line for any war in the Pacific. It's the posting every serviceman dreams of. A subtropical idyll, smack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Beaches, girls, lots of liberty, and a workload that never gets too taxing. Nice shot. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. So about this beer. Several hours behind Washington, it is still night in Pearl Harbor, and war is the very last thing on the mind of two young sailors. That's my shot. Man, wait, I've been practicing. Easy, killer. Easy, easy. William Stafford and Martin Matthews out on liberty for the weekend from their Pearl Harbor postings. Is Charlie's where you said we found the girls? Oh yeah, I found a lot of girls down at Charlie's. The two boys are old friends from Dallas. <laughs> Matthews has followed his friend into the Navy, though by rights he shouldn't be there at all. He's just 15 and has lied about his age to sign up. William was home on leave from the Navy, and I'd run around with him some. He was wearing a uniform, and it seemed like he got all the attention from all the girls. And I decided that was the route I wanted to go. Yes! Did you see that little lady? The Navy was looking for personnel, Can we get some beers over here? and they kind of turned their head about the age.
For the last year, this small port on Oahu's western coast has been home to the American Navy's vast Pacific fleet. Ever since the threat of war in East Asia, the Navy has been quietly working to transform Pearl Harbor into a Pacific fortress, and the docks bristle with battleships. Here on what is known as Battleship Row, lie some of the greatest vessels in the American fleet, lined up like sardines in a tin. Legendary names, like the Arizona, the Maryland, and the Tennessee. With the combined firepower of 64 massive naval guns, it is an awesome display of force, the embodiment of American power in the Pacific. The man in charge of all these battleships is Fleet Admiral Husband E. Kimmel. Kimmel is a career officer, and though by reputation a workaholic, is admired and respected by the men under his command. Surely the day is up. Oh, oh. Who is that? <laughs> that, was, that was old man Kimmel, my boy. That's the Admiral. <laughs> With all those battleships and a further force of almost 400 aircraft to defend them, Kimmel and the US Navy regard Pearl Harbor as impregnable. The perfect base from which to launch America's response to any Japanese aggression in the Pacific. Commander Kramer has just received a further intercepted cable from Tokyo. Brotherhood! If the earlier intercept caused concern, this latest one has rung alarm bells. You need to call the White House. Let them know that there's another magic pouch on the way that the President needs to see immediately. The cable contains two instructions. The first orders the Japanese embassy to burn their diplomatic code books but it is the second that troubles Kramer the most. It orders the Japanese ambassador to deliver the message announcing their withdrawal from the peace talks at exactly 1 p.m. today. Kramer immediately suspects that such precisely timed orders from Tokyo could be a vital clue to Japanese intentions. 1 p.m. in Washington will be early morning across the Pacific. Using a time zone chart, he begins working out the equivalent time over at U.S. Pacific bases. It will be 2 in the morning in the Philippines, 4 in the morning on their base in Guam, and at 7.30 in the morning in Pearl Harbor. From his intimate knowledge of Japan, Kramer knows that historically, the surprise attack is one of Japan's favored war tactics. Early Sunday morning will be an ideal time for them to launch a preemptive strike. That's just over four hours away. Thousands of miles away, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, lies the confirmation of Commander Kramer's concerns. Under conditions of strict radio silence, the largest aircraft carrier fleet ever assembled is under full steam. Six carriers, with some 355 aircraft. Two battleships, three cruisers, and nine destroyers, 31 vessels in all. Their destination, Pearl Harbor. 
Japan has calculated that to gain the free hand in East Asia, far from avoiding the US Pacific fleet in their island fortress, they must instead destroy it. In that goal, they are supremely confident. For Japan has developed technology that will transform the future of naval warfare. From now on, it would be air power that matters at sea. Thanks to her engineering prowess, Japan has created a fleet of aircraft carriers that would render her enemy's huge battleships obsolete. Her naval commanders believed that by getting the carriers up close to the enemy under conditions of secrecy, it would be possible to annihilate their ships from the air before they had a chance to respond. This operation will be the first time the new strategy is put to the test. Everything now depends on maintaining that element of stealth. Deep in the bowels of the flagship Akagi lies the radio room. The radio operators scan every available frequency for the slightest clue that the position of the fleet has been compromised. The traditional Hawaiian music from Oahu's main radio station is a sign that all is well on the island. The element of surprise is theirs. Japanese attack has been planned down to the last detail. Including the precise order in which the targets will be struck. For Japan has spies on Oahu and they've been busy down in Pearl Harbor. For the last week, Takeo Yoshikawa of the Japanese consulate in Honolulu has been sending daily coded messages back to his masters in Tokyo of every warship, aircraft carrier, and cruiser in port. On board the Japanese flagship Akagi, Vice Admiral Nagumo reviews the plan of attack one last time. It is audacious in the extreme. The Americans had always considered Pearl Harbor to be invulnerable to attack by torpedo bomber because it was too shallow. But the Japanese have found their Achilles heel. In a technique they've been rehearsing for months, they've developed torpedoes that can be dropped from a plane into shallow water. Those torpedo bombers will lead the attack on Pearl Harbor. Then, a message from Tokyo. It gives the latest details on the ships at anchor, relayed from their spy on the ground in Pearl Harbor. The following ships were observed at anchor on the 6th. Nine battleships, three light cruisers, three submarine tenders, 17 destroyers. And in addition, there are four light cruisers and two destroyers lying at docks. Down in the Akagi's briefing room, it is one hour before takeoff. 
pilots are going through the choreographed wave of assaults one last time. The man who will command the attack from the air is one of Japan's most distinguished aviators, the flying ace Mitsuo Fujida. Fujida had a strong fighting spirit, his best quality. He was also a gifted leader with the ability to understand any given situation and to react to it quickly. He was not only our best flight leader, but also a good staff man, cooperative and clear-headed. As six o'clock approaches, the Japanese pilots begin heading out to the aircraft that now crowd the deck like insects. Typical of the military class now ruling Japan, Fuchida and his fellow pilots are followers of Bushido, the way of the samurai. Fearlessness in the face of the enemy and a strict code that regarded death in battle as the highest honor were the Bushido's core values. Huddled on the flight decks is a formidable array of aircraft, representing some of the most sophisticated killing machinery in the world, planes that can easily outclass their American rivals. With fuel tanks loaded up to the brim, Plane after plane will take to the air from the fleet's six aircraft carriers. It will take them an hour and three quarters to reach Pearl Harbor. The greatest air assault in history is finally underway. This Sunday morning, commander of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Kimmel, is looking forward to a rare day off from his usual punishing work routine. Later, he's got a game of golf booked with his army counterpart. The call is from his headquarters, one of his destroyers patrolling outside Pearl Harbor, the USS Ward, has engaged an unidentified submarine with depth charges. With Pearl Harbor's awesome air defenses, Kimmel has always considered an air attack on the fleet in port mm -hmm. unthinkable. But not so an attack out at sea. With tensions with Japan running high, he's put his ships in the Pacific on alert for Japanese submarines. Right. But there's been a spate of false sightings. Kimmel wonders whether this isn't just another one. Have them contact my staff and meet me at HQ. Send up my car immediately, please. Telegram has just arrived in Hawaii from Washington. Japanese are presenting at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today what amounts to an ultimatum. Just what significance the hour set may have, we do not know, but be on alert accordingly.
But because of problems on the military circuit to Hawaii, it's been sent via a domestic cable carrier. And there's nothing to indicate just how urgent a message it is. It will have to wait its turn to be delivered. Alongside all the other routine messages the courier will be delivering around the island today. So what are you going to show me today? I'm definitely going to take you up to mid-deck. I got up earlier than usual because of the excitement of being aboard a battleship, being as I'd never been aboard a battleship before. What about the guns? Ah, guns. 15-year-old seaman Martin Matthews has been given dispensation to spend the night on board the USS Arizona with his friend William Stafford. For Matthews, it is a dream come true, a chance to spend time on one of the greatest battleships in the American Navy. To this impressionable young sailor, the Arizona is a truly awesome sight. Wait till you see this, man. This is unbelievable. Running 600 feet from bow to stern, and with 12 14-inch guns, she is the very embodiment of the United States' ability to project her power overseas. smells good. <laughs> so, how long were you at the Just south of Pearl Harbor, nurse Ruth Erickson's day is starting just as it does every Sunday, with a slow breakfast in the nurses' quarters. So is everybody planning on doing this morning? I was thinking of going and playing tennis this afternoon. Would someone like to join me? I would. I know why she wants to go play tennis. Oh, well then, maybe I shouldn't join. <laughs> with its 34 doctors and 30 nurses, the hospital has been built to deal with the casualties of a Pacific war the United States hopes will never happen. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> also, you girls did a great job last week. You really worked hard. The most these nurses have ever had to cope with is the odd broken bone and cases of venereal disease among the sailors. a five inch 38 millimeter dual purpose. What's dual purpose mean? Uh, let's just say that you can knock down anything from the sky or on the ground. Wow. We were gonna go ashore again and spend some more liberty, but then we heard noise over to our starboard side. You could see a bunch of planes coming in. Nobody's paying any attention to it. It is just before eight o'clock. Across the fleet, crew are standing by for a ritual that will be observed on every one of the Navy's ships at anchor this morning, the flag ceremony. Japanese strike force now hovers above a sleepy Pearl Harbor, poised to strike. From the head of the attack squadron, Fuchida breaks radio silence to transmit his first signal back to the carrier fleet and to Tokyo. The coded message announces that the element of surprise they have worked so hard to achieve is theirs. Within minutes, Pearl Harbor is in flames. Admiral Kimmel is on the phone to his headquarters for a second time, 
when the news comes through that Pearl Harbor is under attack. They're what? I'll be right down. Arizona, general quarters are sounding, calling the men to their battle stations. But as a visitor on ship, Martin Matthews has no battle station of his own to go to. Come on, come on, come on. just a sec. I'll be right back for you. Get down. He says goodbye to William Stafford and can only look on as the chaos unleashed by the Japanese bombs unfolds around him. I was scared to death. This is not what I went in the Navy for, and this is not what I wanted. I had no place to go. I didn't have a general quarter station. I wouldn't have known what to have done if I went to one. I was too damn young to realize what was going on and didn't know that this was a war breaking out. Quarter! Thank you. Two or three of us were sitting in the dining room Sunday morning, having a late breakfast and talking over coffee. Also, you girls did a great job last week. You really worked hard. <laughs> Hello. Suddenly, we heard planes roaring overhead, and we said, the Flyboys are really busy at Fort Island this morning. We no sooner got those words out when we started to hear noises that were foreign to us. What? Oh, no. We'll be right there. Girls, this is a real thing. Move! We've got to get to the hospital. Rosella, it's war. What do we do when we get there? How many do you think are going to be? Just as they have rehearsed dozens of times, the torpedo bombers sweep in low down the line of Pearl Harbor's southeast lock on their bombing run up to Battleship Row. Within minutes of the beginning of the attack, the bombers have scored direct hits on the battleships California, Oklahoma, and Arizona, the great war horses of the Pacific Fleet. Kimmel's staff are struggling to comprehend the scale and ferocity of the Japanese attack. What's going on at this time? We just can't raise them on the radios. Send the following message to all stations and ships. Oglala. Hostilities with Japan commenced with air raid on Pearl Harbor. Yes, sir. Sir. Kimmel's first task is focusing his staff around the launch of a counterattack. But that will be impossible unless they can defend their ships. And that's supposed to be down to Pearl Harbor's extensive air defenses. Why in the hell are there any air cover? The island is dotted with airfields. The force of 400 planes intended as an iron shield in the defense of Pearl Harbor's battleships. They're supposed to have been regular defensive air patrols, but fuel shortages have more often than not kept the planes on the ground. Without that air cover, the Japanese bombers had the freedom of the skies to pick off Pearl Harbor's planes and battleships as they please. Can you raise Arizona? What direction are these planes coming? 
Kimmel's best hope lies with getting his undamaged ships out to sea as quickly as possible so that they can start hunting down the location of the Japanese fleet. I want the ready destroyer out and the standby destroyer to get up steam right away. But tracking it down will be like finding a needle in a haystack. Kimmel knows they could be anywhere within a perimeter of 250 miles, an area the size of Germany. The Oklahoma, the Arizona, the West Virginia, the Oklahoma. Nurse Erickson and her colleagues immediately start their emergency drill, filling every available container with water for the instrument boilers that will be needed throughout the day. The wounded, many of them horrendously burned, begin flooding into the hospital. At half past eight, just 30 minutes after the beginning of the attack, seven of the fleet's eight battleships are out of commission. The Japanese attack is going precisely to plan. With bombs spent and fuel levels now running low, Fuchida issues the signal to his bomber squadrons to return to the carriers. But a new, further phase of the Japanese operation is still to come. It is now over an hour since the message warning of the attack first arrived at the cable company offices in Honolulu. It is still sitting in the courier's pouch, waiting to be delivered. I wound up in the water. I don't know whether it was the bomb explosion while I was on the top deck that knocked me over, or whether it was the inner emotion. The harbor awash with flames and burning oil Seaman Martin Matthews heads for a mooring buoy, where he watches the USS Arizona explode after sustaining a direct hit. Her forward ammunition magazines erupting like a volcano. Within minutes, the battleship had sunk with the loss of almost 1,200 men. When the Arizona finally started blowing up, it was ammunition, gun lockers and shells and fragments and pyrotechnics coming, it seemed to me, from all parts of the ship. I decided to get the hell away from that mooring buoy. Yes, Mr. Bowman. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. Can't believe they've actually done it. In Washington, Secretary of State Cordell Hull has just been given news of the attacks by President Roosevelt when the Japanese ambassador Nomura arrives for his meeting. All right, we'll send them in. Nomura is here to deliver the document that angrily announces Japan's severing of diplomatic ties with the United States, a document which Hull already knows the contents of, thanks to America's top-secret code-breaking operation. What's the significance of the timing? But unlike Hull, the Japanese ambassador still hasn't been informed about his country's attack on Pearl Harbor. When I finished skimming the pages, I turned to Nomura and put my eye on him. In all of our conversations over the last nine months, 
I have never, I have uttered, never uttered one word of untruth. This is borne out absolutely by the record. In all my 50 years of public service, I have never seen a document that was more crowded with infamous falsehoods and distortions on a scale so huge that I never imagined until today that any government on this planet was capable of uttering them. Nomura seemed about to say something. I stopped him with a motion of my hand. The ambassadors turned without a word and walked out, their heads down. In the Pacific Ocean, 250 miles north of Oahu, the second wave of the Japanese assault on Pearl Harbor is heading out from the carriers. This further wave of planes is made up of dive bombers and high-level bombers, together with an escort of Zero fighters, around 170 aircraft in all. For this second wave, standing orders are as clear as they are simple, to hit whatever's left. But Pearl Harbor's defenses are finally starting to kick in. There's now an effective anti-aircraft barrage and some US fighter pilots have even managed to get into the air. At the Naval Hospital, the wounded are now arriving in ever greater numbers. Uh, uh, Donnie! The tropical dress at the time was white t-shirts and shorts. The burns began where the pants ended. Bared arms and faces were plentiful. The nurses and doctors battled to cope with the sheer numbers of wounded. Many will need surgery for the trauma wounds caused by explosives and shrapnel. Others are horrendously burned after jumping from their stricken ships into the oil fires that now cover the harbor. Personnel retrieved a supply of flick guns from stock. We filled these with tannic acid to spray burned bodies. Then we gave these gravely injured patients sedatives for their intense pain. leader, Mitsuo Fuchida, is now in the last plane left over Pearl Harbor. It is vital that before he returns to ship, he compiles an accurate assessment of the damage inflicted. Knowing exactly how many ships remain will not just decide whether to launch a third wave, it will also inform Japanese naval strategy in the Pacific over the coming months. Finally, he gives his pilot the order to return to base.
At Admiral Kimmel's headquarters, the effects of the second wave of Japanese bombing are becoming apparent. Kimmel was just numb. He kept sitting around, staring glass-eyed into space. Kimmel looked shocked by the enormity of the thing that was happening to his command and by the fact that the world was blowing up around him. Since the beginning of the second wave, a further two battleships have been sunk. Of the eight great ships moored on Battleship Row that morning, those great symbols of American naval power and the means by which she would rule the waves in the Pacific, five are sunk and none are seaworthy. America's traditional naval strategy had been felled at a blow by Japan's new aircraft carrier tactics. What's the latest damage report? Sir, the latest information we have. Three destroyers have also been lost, including the USS Shaw, which explodes in a vast fireball as her ammunition magazine becomes engulfed by the raging blaze. When the Shah blew up, I was in Admiral Kimmel's office, and I never want again to see a look on a man's face as I saw in Kimmel's. In total, 21 vessels stand disabled by the Japanese bombers. And by the final count, 164 American planes will have been lost for just 29 Japanese aircraft. America's humiliation is complete. When he finally returns to the Akagi, Fuchida is immediately summoned to the bridge deck where the Japanese fleet commander, Vice Admiral Nagumo, is waiting to be briefed. The decision Nagumo must now take will be perhaps the most important of the day does he send in a third wave, or does he give the order to return to port? Crucially, Nagumo asks, will the US fleet be able to operate out of Pearl Harbor within six months? His chief pilot is confident it will not. It is the answer Nagumo has been hoping for. Without the element of surprise and anxious to protect his fleet, he gives the order to return to port. On Oahu, the shock of the attack is giving way to a real sense of anger as the extent of the casualties and damage finally hits home. Volunteers from all walks of life come forward to offer their help in the cleanup operation. Japanese consular officials know that they will be raided at any moment. It is vital they destroy their secret code books before they can fall into American hands. When the FBI finally arrive, it is too late. The raid marks the beginning of a wider crackdown that will see tens of thousands of Japanese Americans interned in the course of the war. Go! Down, boys! Let's go! Seaman Martin Matthews is now back at his post at the airstrip on Ford Island's naval station. There was very little left to resemble a naval air station as far as when the bomb attack was over. You could see hulks of hangars and hulks of airplanes, but I don't think there was one plane that was completely intact at all after it was all over. With fears of further attacks, the first task is to clear the debris from the bombing so that the port and airstrips can be reopened.
It was a comedy of errors from the word go. The Navy was unprepared. None of the personnel I knew had been trained for an imminent attack. The gunners weren't trained. The ammunition wasn't readily available. Damage control wasn't available. Watertight hatches were never closed. It was complete pandemonium. The men will work flat out for the next three days with very little sleep. Part of a heroic effort to return Pearl Harbor to operational status as quickly as possible. For Matthews, the enormity of what has happened begins to sink in. He has not seen his friend William Stafford since saying goodbye to him on the Arizona that morning as the attack began. Stafford is dead, just one of the hundreds of victims across Pearl Harbor that day. Why don't you go home and get some rest and be back at 8 o'clock? Thank you. I'll just finish up here. Bye, Miss Ma'am. I was relieved around 4 p.m. and went over to the nurses' quarters. We were riding on nervous energy and wanted to keep right on going. With hospitals across the island full to capacity, schools are commandeered to become makeshift wards, while members of the public come forward to offer their help and give blood. All told, the Pearl Harbor attack will claim the lives of 2,403 Americans, with almost 1,200 wounded. It will be the largest loss of life on American soil during World War II. Pearl Harbor is just one of a broad wave of attacks launched by Japan across the Pacific that day. They also attack America's Pacific bases on Guam and Wake Island and British interests in Hong Kong and Malaya. Next, they will invade the American-controlled Philippines and the British fortress of Singapore will fall in another devastating surprise swoop. It is the beginning of a carefully calculated assault on East Asia that by the early months of 1942 would see the region fall to Japanese control. Japan's stated goal of building an empire across East Asia looked within her grasp. The twisted hulls of sunken battleships now crowd Pearl Harbor's once majestic docks. All that now awaits Admiral Kimmel is the long process of recrimination as the government demands an explanation of him for what went wrong. Stay on it, stay on it. It will start four days later when Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox arrives from Washington to begin his investigation. Admiral, this just came in for you, sir. Then, as if to add insult to his humiliation, some eight hours after it first arrived on the island, the Washington message, warning of an imminent attack, is finally handed to him. The long blame game that is about to begin will, just weeks later, see Admiral Kimmel being relieved of his command. In Washington, 
Cordell Hull is heading to the White House for the administration's first cabinet meeting since the Pearl Harbor attacks. At the meeting, the president will read them the draft of his address to the special joint session of Congress that he has called for the next morning. Far from being hesitant about a war in the Pacific, as Japan hopes, America does not equivocate for a moment in the path she chooses. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. For all the devastation wrought at Pearl Harbor, it is not the death blow to the US Navy that Japan had hoped for. In a salvage operation of unprecedented speed, in under a fortnight, three of Battleship Row's eight ships are back in service. And critically, Pearl Harbor's two aircraft carriers, out at sea during the attacks, are left unscathed. Six months later, the Pacific fleet will take its revenge at the Battle of Midway, when it sinks four Japanese carriers. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. With this speech, a nation with an aversion to foreign wars and whose army was smaller than Yugoslavia's would in two years become the world's greatest military power. Humiliation would rain down on Germany and Europe as it would on Japan in the Pacific. With the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, America would become a superpower a decision that would change the course of world history.